Like what gives something value isn't the technology, it's the social construct. You say it's valuable, I say it's valuable, therefore it's valuable. In the excitement of building this crypto industry, we attracted a lot of frauds, uh, you know, bad actors, criminals, 180 million people around the world that without a gun to their head, take their hard earned savings and store it in this community of people that run this technology, you know, called Bitcoin. Galaxy Digital founder and CEO Mike Novogratz considers himself to be one of the crypto industry's elder statesmen. I always joke I'm the oldest guy in the space. Um, and I have been kind of an unofficial spokesman for Bitcoin, but for crypto. The billionaire investor led a decades-long career in traditional finance as a partner at Goldman Sachs and president of private equity firm Fortress. Then came crypto. I was learning venture, uh, working with a ton of young people, and had this role in the community as a senior voice that had been in institutional finance. Novogratz first bought Bitcoin when it was trading around $100 each. By 2017, prices rose roughly 19,000 percent. And in 2018, he founded Galaxy, an investment firm focused on the digital and crypto economy. Since then, crypto markets have been volatile, to say the least. Post-COVID, with all the free money that the government was giving away, everyone was trading these coins and they were trading on momentum and, and people made a lot of money and lost a lot of money. After Bitcoin prices peaked in late 2021, 2022 brought the collapse of a number of crypto firms, including the high profile implosion of crypto exchange FTX and the arrest of its founder, Sam Bankman Fried. I spent a lot of time with Sam. I didn't invest with them. Uh, I always thought their valuation was too high, uh, but he was kind, he was always helpful to me. We lost money. Uh, we, we didn't invest with them, but we used them as an exchange. I just never assumed I'm dealing with a sociopath. Novogratz knows the past year has hurt the crypto industry, but he remains a true believer. It feels like the crypto community is tough and resilient. I mean, I have a tattoo of Bitcoin. You know, there is a religious zeal to people in the Bitcoin community that you don't see in the equity community. So you are one of the leading advocates in the world for cryptocurrencies. You've made a fair amount of money. It is reported in cryptocurrencies. I assume you've lost some <laughs> when, when it went down a little bit. But uh, what propelled you to be interested in cryptocurrencies? When did you first get interested in it? You know, I got a call from Pete Brigger, who was actually my partner at Fortress, who was probably the l least likely to call you about cryptocurrencies. But he had moved to California, and everyone was talking about a thing called Bitcoin. So he called me up, he said, what do you know about Bitcoin? And at that point I knew nothing. And so I did a quick dive into it and quickly realized it's a macro asset. I've spent my life as a macroeconomic investor. So you got started and you bought initially what? You know, I bought, uh, it was trading about $100, $95. You mean for Bitcoin? For Bitcoin. We ended up calling Dan Moorhead, who had run a hedge fund that I had backed. I said, Dan, look into this. Like we're thinking about this. And Dan came back and said, this might be the most important innovation of our lifetime. I was like, whoa. That's, and Dan was, went to Princeton with us. He put a lot of money into it. And, you know, I was a lot richer than Dan at the time. So I said, I've got to put at least that much in. <laughs> and so we end up, we bought a substantial amount, you know, about $3 million each. $3 million of Bitcoin. And we did coin was $100 and $100, yeah. And Bitcoin is now, I think, around 31000 of Bitcoin. Roughly 30,000. And it went as high as 70,000 at one yes. point. So when it went from 70,000 to 16,000, were you getting nervous? You know, it went from 8,000 to 70,000 uh, as a response to COVID, as a response to the reaction to COVID, right? When every central bank in the world just flooded the world with money. As a macro asset, it was supposed to go up and then come back down, and it did. It went further than it should have because in the excitement of building this crypto industry, we attracted a lot of frauds, uh, you know, bad actors, criminals. Well, there's one person I interviewed once, I met about a year or so ago, named Sam Bankman Fried. <laughs> uh, were you shocked at what happened there? You know, yes. And I spent a lot of time with Sam. I didn't invest with him. Uh, I always thought their valuation was too high, uh, but he was kind, he was always helpful to me. We lost money. Uh, we, we didn't invest with them, but we used them as an exchange. 
and people ask me, well, if you didn't invest, you were a little leery. I was like, I just never assumed I'm dealing with a sociopath. Uh, it's hard to risk managing against that. But do you think that really hurt the industry for some time? It certainly did. And, and it wasn't just Sam, right? We had Celsius, Alex Machinsky, who's now been arrested. Uh, there are four or five, three arrows capital of either guys that started off as frauds or that as the, the heat got turned on, made really, really bad risk decisions. So the ones that got hurt were, I think, three arrow. Three arrows. Terra. Terra. One. Right. And um, FTX, obviously. FTX. And Celsius. Celsius. BlockFi is another one. So you were a big supporter of Terra. I was. Off, and I was told you have a tattoo <laughs> on you somewhere. I do. Good reminder of uh, hubris uh, at times. Can you tell us who the inventor of Bitcoin is? Well, Satoshi Nakamoto is, is, the, is that? the inventor. Nobody knows. And I, quite frankly, I think if we knew Bitcoin might not be where it is. Like, what gives something value isn't the technology, it's the social construct. You say it's valuable, I say it's valuable, therefore it's valuable. And I think if we knew who the inventor of Bitcoin was, we'd be a little more skeptical in saying, ah, I, I'm going to buy into this as a place I store my value. Like, there's something about the mystery of not knowing who Satoshi is. So we don't know who Bitcoin founder is, but uh, we do know that Bitcoin is by far the leading cryptocurrency. And you think we'll remain that for a while? I do. I think, I think what's neat about Bitcoin is it's a finished product. It doesn't have to change to fulfill its destiny, right? The other parts of crypto, we're, we're, we're in a, a build and get better phase. But Bitcoin's done. It, it functions perfectly as digital gold. And all we're in now is an adoption cycle. I think the most important thing that happened this year in Bitcoin is Larry Fink. Uh, he got orange-pilled, as we say. orange pill is when you take a non-believer and you make him a believer in Bitcoin. And Larry was a non-believer, and now he says, hey, this is going to be a global currency. Uh, people around the world all trust it. Well, BlackRock is the biggest asset. BlackRock is now doing an ETF or trying to do an ETF for Bitcoin. Yes. Is that a big change in the industry? Yes, for, for Larry in particular, right, who, who was the CEO of this iconic company to say, I believe in this, right? That, that's kind of huge because again, like when Elizabeth Warren says, well, I don't believe in Bitcoin, I'm like, well, Elizabeth, Larry Fink does, Stan Druckenmiller does, Jeff Yost does, uh, the richest person in your state, you know, uh, Abby Johnson does. Like, just because you don't doesn't mean it's not real. By the end of this year, where do you think Bitcoin will be? You know, there, there are two major factors that I'll give you. One is when the Fed pivots. The moment the Fed starts cutting, Bitcoin will go a lot higher. And when we get this ETF adopted. And so I think you, know, you could be substantially through the old highs once those two things happen. Let's talk about your background a moment. Uh, you grew up in Northern Virginia? I did. And what did your parents do? You know, my dad was a career army officer and my mom was a career hustler. Uh, housewife, antique, you know, s selling. At one point she was a waitress. Uh, and you had a fair number of siblings? I have, I one of seven, I'm the third of seven. So four boys, three girls. Uh, we used to say four boys, three girls, two bathrooms. Uh, and one was my parents. With an army salary, a military salary, seven kids, you probably didn't have a lot of money growing up. We, we were straight middle class. So you were a star wrestler in high school, and I think you were the Virginia State champion? I lost in the finals with about four seconds left, which I still wake up about once a month thinking about. Well, what happened to the person who beat you? He presumably is not a, a Bitcoin a billionaire. No, he's not. He's not. So, so in the long run, maybe I should stop thinking about him so much. But So you did well in high school, and you must have done well academically as well, because you went to Princeton. I did. So when you graduated, what did you do? I went to the Army. I was a helicopter pilot. Uh, in Fort Rucker, Alabama, what great year. Uh, I'd done ROTC to help finance Princeton. After you left the military, did you say, I want to be a trader, I'm going to go to Goldman or something? I actually went to Washington, D.C. I said, I want to work in D.C. I met a, an ex-Princeton guy who had been the assistant secretary of the Army. Um, and he said, son, go to Wall Street and make some money. You can come back to D.C. when you're 40 or 50. I went to Wall Street. I lived on my friend's couch and got a job at Goldman Sachs as a money market salesman. Was it easy to get a job at Goldman Sachs? You didn't have any background in this area. You know, I walked in and I made this pitch that I was a star wrestler and I was in the Army. And the guy said, well, how do you know you're going to be able to handle the pressure of Goldman Sachs? And I said, have you ever flown a helicopter and been talking to air support and shooting at people at the same time? I was like, no. 
Well, I hadn't either, but I said that, and so they hired me. And did you become a partner at Goldman? I became a partner in 1998. Uh, was that before they went public? That was right six months before they went public, so it was so a good you, time. you were a partner, partner when they went public? I was. Okay, well, that's pretty good. I've had three IPOs, Goldman, Fortress, and Galaxy. So you became a partner at Goldman, and then how many years were you there before you decided to leave? Only about a year and a half uh, and took off. It was one of the, the, the least glamorous chapters of my life. Uh, and uh, I'd become the president for Goldman Latin America and then got myself in trouble that I would refer to as too much wine, women, and song. And so right. I, I left with my tail between my legs. Pete Brigger, my old partner from Goldman and classmate, called me and said, hey, let's work together. And so. So you started Fortress? Fortress, Wes Edens had started it earlier, but it was about a 40 person company. So Pete and I bought into that partnership. So you ultimately left Fortress to start your own firm, is that right? I started a family office and realized family office is a pretty nice way to make a living. Everyone comes, they shine your shoes, they give you ideas. And I wasn't gonna go back to work unless I could find something that I could work with young people, uh, that I learned something new, uh, and that I could make a difference. And crypto kind of blew up again, and I was like, blew up in a good way, and I was like, learning venture, uh, working with a ton of young people, and had this role in the community as a senior voice that had been in institutional finance. So today, uh, tell us what Galaxy is. How big is it? We have a sales and trading business where we make markets, derivatives, lending, kind of a classic sales and trading business for people in crypto. We have an asset management business where we manage other people's money, an investment banking business, and then an infrastructure business where we do mining, staking as a service, uh, helping on the infrastructure of the company. So today, um, you are the CEO and the founder. You intend to do this for the foreseeable future? For the foreseeable future. You're younger than me, but in the crypto world, you're an older man compared to some of the teenagers that are doing this. So are you the grand old man of the uh, crypto world? I'm one of them. I, I, I joke around all the time that I'm the oldest guy in crypto, but I think I've met one or two guys that are roughly my age. Gary Gensler at the SEC has been saying over and over, the rules are clear, just follow the rules. And we had a federal judge that said, the rules are nothing close to clear. The SEC is cracking down on crypto. This year, the Securities and Exchange Commission has ramped up enforcement actions against some of the biggest names in the crypto industry, like Coinbase, Binance, Gemini, and Genesis. Since their inception, cryptocurrencies and digital tokens have existed in a regulatory gray area. SEC Chair Gary Gensler believes most cryptocurrencies are securities meaning his agency has the power to regulate them. One big argument the SEC is alleging, many crypto tokens were never registered with the SEC and therefore many firms are selling or providing an exchange for unregistered securities. The crypto industry disagrees with Gensler that digital tokens should be classified as securities and so does a federal judge, at least partially. In July, the SEC's argument suffered a major setback when a judge ruled that in some scenarios, Ripple Lab's digital token XRP is not considered a security. But the ruling was narrow, and the SEC may appeal. For now, regulatory uncertainty looms large over the crypto industry. The SEC uh, said that Ripple was a currency, and uh, or security, I should say, and therefore they sued uh, Ripple, arguing that Ripple should be able to do what it wanted to do, and the SEC lost in federal court. Is that a big victory for the crypto industry, or do you think the SEC is going to appeal? I think the SEC probably appeals. I think it was a huge victory, and it's a victory mostly in that, forget who was right or who was wrong. Gary Gensler at the SEC has been saying over and over, the rules are clear, just follow the rules. And we had a federal judge that said, the rules are nothing close to clear. But our, our stance, Mike Novogratz's galaxies and the whole industry stance has been, help us get clear rules, because they're not clear. And so I think loud and clear, the message was, Gary, you've been wrong, that the rules aren't clear, and, and Congress has to get its tail in gear to get us some rules. Now, Coinbase is one of the best known companies in the crypto industry. It makes markets for people that want to trade in crypto. 
but the SEC has recently taken action against uh, Coinbase and argued that it's doing things that are illegal. What is your view on that? Listen, I think Brian Armstrong is brave, and, and he's, it's an interesting strategy to fight this in public. He's like, this is unfair. And what he's saying, in essence, what I just said, the rules weren't clear. The approach from the SEC to regulate through enforcement and to really thwart our industry, which feels like it's come from Elizabeth Warren and Sherrod Brown and maybe Lael Brainerd and a few people, uh, we called it choke point 2.0 operation, uh, seems obvious and is just un-American. And it feels like the crypto community is tough and resilient. One of the things I learned is these communities don't go away. They believe, I mean, I have a tattoo of Bitcoin. You know, there is a religious zeal to people in the Bitcoin community. The U.S. government is probably not a big fan of crypto, I think it's fair to say, the current U.S. government. So are you worried that the U.S. government will impose regulations on crypto that might thwart the growth of the industry? Well, the U.S. government has been thwarting the growth of the industry, right? Gary Gensler and the White House, uh, Gary at the SEC, has been regulating through enforcement in a really, what I think is unfortunate and unfair way. Uh, the tax that they've put on companies like ours is extreme. We'll spend $10 million on our audit. A normal audit should have cost $3 million. Crypto should be bipartisan. And it was heading that way until Sam Bankman fried blew up and the Democrats felt stupid. And that opened a window where Elizabeth Warren and Sherrod Brown and the few anti-crypto progressives decided crypto wasn't progressive. Which is crazy because I can't think of anything more progressive than but crypto. It seems to me that the Republicans on Capitol Hill seem to be more supportive of the crypto industry than Democrats. Much is that more, fair? Much more. And is that because they like free market economics or what, what's the reason you think? You know, crypto is complicated, right? Bitcoin is a freedom, right? It's freedom. It's the, keep the government out of my business. Uh, and so we, we, even when we think about stable coins, we will have stable coins in every country in the world. So a stable coin is a digital representation of the national currency. You can have them like China, where the central government knows every penny you spend on what you spend it on. Or you can have them very decentralized, where the government, where they look, look and feel a lot like just digital cash and anything in between. And so it's a real important debate uh, the Republican side is more freedom. But outside of the United States, a number of countries are encouraging uh, crypto companies to come there because they say we have better regulation or less regulation. So do you think the U.S. will lose itself as a center of crypto industry? Uh, to we, we are, slowly but surely, more and more. I mean, you see uh, A16Z is setting up in, uh, in, in a big office in London. We are moving more people to Hong Kong and to London. Um, and so it's frustrating. I think in the long run, crypto needs the US. Like, it's hard to have a global system without the biggest economy, but it is unbelievably unfortunate how long it's taking us. Now, your company is headquartered in New York, where we are now. Uh, do you envision actually taking your company offshore and headquartering offshore because there are more favorable regulations to cryptocurrencies? We're gonna move parts of our company offshore, but I, I just love this city, and so I don't see us not being in the US or being in New York, but we'll, we will move substantial pieces. Now recently, Sam Altman, who's famous for um, his involvement with, uh, with artificial intelligence, has his own new Bitcoin version, I guess not Bitcoin, but a cryptocurrency called Worldcoin. Now, Worldcoin supposedly uses the, the uh, retina to, to identify the user. Uh, do you think this is the future or? You know, digital identity is really, really important and it hasn't been cracked yet. Um, there's lots of ways we can identify people. We can buy attestation. I know David Rubenstein, therefore he's David Rubenstein. I can attest to it, right? Through a government a licensing problem. You have a driver's license, right? You can have a digital version of that. Um, biometrics is a piece. It's scary to give up your biometrics, in essence, just for free or for <laughs> to be able to get this coin. Uh, but it might work, right? We do it on Bloomberg. Every time we log into Bloomberg, we put our fingerprint down there. Uh, and, and so how we decide how important privacy is and who gets the data and who gets to do what with the data is really important. So uh, you think there will be uh, this, this new uh, world um, coin will take off or it's too early to know? I, you know, I think you don't want to bet against Sam Altman right now. <laughs> and so I think the price potentially could go a lot higher because there's a, 
an AI hype cycle. I don't know if we will all use that as our identity. The most common mistake is greed, and everyone wants to you know, hit the lottery ticket, and that's just not the way it works. So for the average person who doesn't know much about cryptocurrencies but wants to participate in something that he or she thinks is going to be around for a while, what do you recommend? Do they buy the, the coin themselves, the currency themselves, buy your stock, uh, have somebody like you advise them? What should the average person do? Yeah, I think the average person should either stick to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and my stock, uh, or do a whole lot of homework themselves or have an advisor. It's a, you know, Post-COVID, with all the free money that the government was giving away, there was a casino uh, and everyone was trading these coins and they were trading on momentum and, and people made a lot of money and lost a lot of money uh, in the long run for things to have value. Communities need to believe it and there needs to be utility. So a couple final questions. Um, if, what's the best investment advice you've ever received? It probably comes from Paul Jones and he talks about the pain of the gain that most great fortunes are made in trend. And so you see a big trend. And what happens, think about Bitcoin. If I had sold Bitcoin when it went from 100 to 200, and I doubled my money and I would have been walking around like a, a rooster and high-fiving all my friends, when you're in trend, stay in trend. And, and we call it the pain of the gain. I say sometimes you have to handcuff yourself to the chair so you can't hit the sell button. What is the most common mistake you see investors making? The most common mistake is greed. It's, you know, they have a great return and they want 10x. Early on in crypto, before I had a public company, all these wrestling coaches would call me and I'd say, hey, you should buy this token. They always want to know what token to buy. And they'd buy a token, it would go up. And then I would sometimes call them and say, hey, I'm selling, you probably should sell. And they wouldn't sell. And I was like, you asked me what token. I'm in the middle of the universe. Why aren't you listening to me? Well, their friend Joey was telling them not to sell. And I was like, who the hell's Joey? <laughs> you know? And I realized they had made good money, but not enough. It hadn't changed their life. And everyone wants to you know, hit the lottery ticket. And that's just not the way it works. Where would you recommend a person with $100,000 take that money and invest it? You know, if they were young and had a high risk tolerance, I'd be buying Alibaba stock. I'd be buying silver, gold, Bitcoin, and Ethereum. That would be my portfolio. If they had a lower risk tolerance, I'd say put 30% in a portfolio like that and the other 70% in you know, the bonds and maybe an index fund. You've obviously done quite well in the uh, cryptocurrency world. Is there another world beyond cryptocurrencies you're looking at, something that's going to be the next great thing or not yet? Um, you know, biotech fasc fascinates me still. Uh, you know, what worries me actually from a societal perspective is we have these technological advances that are happening so fast in health and healthcare and biotech and gene editing. And yet we have cities like Kinshasa where 13 million people don't have electricity. Uh, and so we're hurtling to a world that looks like Blade Runner, where this elite group of people live this life we could never have imagined. And they have the masses that are in this teeming soup. Um, but I think when I think of it, those big changes, biotech is still a, a pretty interesting spot. <laughs>